Awe, citizen of the Empire, welcome to the glorious legion, the Legionis. My name is Marcus Tullius Aurelius, but you can call me Marcus. I heard you come from the northern areas, the boundaries, the borders of the Empire. Well, we've had quite a lot of changes here. We don't have Velites and Equites anymore. They've all become Auxilia. Being a legionary is not a duty to Rome anymore. It's a profession. And now come the general, the legatus, has given the order. The legion is on the move. We better not be late or the centurio will punish us. Hey, noble ones. Ah, I see you have met Marcus Tullius. Good man, good soldier. But what is he talking about? Well, of course, he is talking about several reforms, military reforms, which occurred in Roman history. But the first one, of course, is the Marian reform, a reform, a military reform initiated by statesman and general Gaius Marius. And this was a very important reform because in this reform, what basically happened to uh, sort of cut a long story short is that the first of all, all the early republican kinds of troops, for example, Triaria Kensi and Princeps Astati, they were all put together as heavy infantry but the fact that he talks about that uh, serving in the military was not only a duty to Rome now it was a profession what does that mean well you have to understand that in Republican time consuls when war threatened had to raise up an army to fight for the defense of Rome but this army of citizen would be mostly land owning citizen and depending on the wealth that these uh, future soldiers had they could um, purchase better equipment and therefore they could be they could become hastati they could become princeps if they had the money to do so or they could become a triari a kensi etc if they didn't have much money so it all really had to do with how much wealth you had because you had to provide for your own equipment also these armies had to be raised up quickly so they were also trained quickly. Now what Gaius Marius does, his reform, is that he creates the professional soldier. What's really uh, interesting is not only the fact that these uh, soldiers were going to uh, be just that, soldiers for at least 16 years at first, then it will become 20 years and then 25 years of service. But um, they could be recruited from the Roman landless masses. What that meant is that everyone could become a legionary. And you have to consider this. Consider you were a Roman citizen, but you know you were very low in the status um, scale. You didn't have land, you didn't have money, perhaps you didn't even have a job or an occupation. And here it comes, a possibility for you to increase your status, the only possibility to have a regular pay, to, who knows, eventually retire and even own land. Well, the masses flocked to General Marius. Also, this meant that the legions were now professionals. They were trained, optimally trained. And this is what made the difference for the Roman military machina. But if we look at uh, the sort of equipment that he's wearing, a lorica segmentata or lorica laminata, then we know that um, we are not in Republican times and the Marian reforms occurred in late Republican times, to be specific, in 107. So the sort of changes, big changes that he's talking about, also involve the changes brought to pass by the very first emperor. Imperator Caius Julius Caesar Octavianus Augustus, in English Augustus. At the time of the Marian reforms, the legion was made of 6,000 men, 4,800 of which were actually combatant and the rest were non-combatant. Then the legion would be uh, subsequently divided into uh, cohorts of 600 men, manipules of 200, centuries of 100, out of which 80 were combatant and 20 were servants again, all the way down to the smallest unit, the Contubernia, which was made of 10 men, 8 of which were soldiers and 2 were servants. So as a milites, meaning a new recruit, in fact milites, legionarius is legionary in Latin, legionari for plural, but you would be a milites in this setting, meaning a private. As a new recruit, you were greeted by Marcus because he is your decanus. You will be sharing food and tent with these 8 men, who will be the closest men to you for the next 25 years. It is after these reforms that each legion would have its own legatus legionis, its own 
permanent general, who is the general delegatus that Marcus Tullius has mentioned beforehand. The only exception to this rule would be the legions in Egypt, who were instead commanded by prefecti legionis. The difference between a legatus and the prefecti legionis is that the legatus legioni would be a member of the senatorial class or senatorial order, whereas the prefecti legionis would be members of equestrian orders. No time to rest, soldier. We're finished with marching today. Now we need to build up the camp. We shall now first build up the fortification around the fort. We will build a palisade around the fort. The fort will have four different entrances. And then tomorrow morning we'll pack up everything and we shall march again. Okay, you have just finished marching, but it's only one day. Um, what is he talking about? Building a camp? Well, Marcus is now talking about the castra. You're about to build your first castrum. In English, a castrum can be uh, translated as a Roman fort or Roman camp. But with the word castra, you meant both a legionary fortress, an auxiliary fortress, a temporary encampment or a marching fort. Now, the one you are about to build is exactly that, a marching fort. At the end of each day of marching, the Roman soldiers had to build a fortification. These were used to defend and house the legion and protect the soldiers and their supply. If the castrum was housing one single legion, it would have a square shape with four entrances. If a castrum was instead housing two legions, it would have a rectangular shape with the headquarters of both legions back to back with each other. As a new recruit, you will probably be part of the 24 hours eight watches, which rotate among the soldiers. Now, what's fascinating about the Roman castra is that they could be built very quickly. In fact, there were lots of different possible plans and we do have a lot of um, very detailed um, explanations on how they were built and how they were supposed to be built. But legions were trained to build fortification properly, very quickly and even under combat, having part of the legion protecting the soldiers building it so that if things became dangerous, the legion couldn't retreat inside the fort and defend itself. You, my friend, are now part of the most efficient military training in the ancient world. Only the Romans were able to build such fortress so effectively, precisely and quickly. Okay, so the uh, part of this video, uh, the reason why I made this video today is because I wanted to share my own experience uh, with marching. And now this whole video took around seven hours to make as far as filming alone is concerned. So you can understand it already. I had to wear armor for that long, always marching, always moving and running and training. And, and you will see some of this because something really, really interesting came up. Well, now that I have marched for so many hours in armor, in segmentata, I know that in imperial times, when you were wearing that sort of armor, first of all, I find that the muscles that are now sore are the back of my shoulders and a little bit the lower back. And for example, the, the fact that my shoulders hurt, yes, that happens each time I wear my segmentata for a certain period of time, but marching with it, also my lower back starts to hurt a little bit, and of course, my feet. But most importantly, a thing that I've learned from this video is the fact that when I walk, I can hear well, but when I run, I become deaf. And that's only me. Imagine inside of a huge unit. The reason for this is because the shoulder plates of segmentata move, okay, and they make a lot of noise. And so much so that I could not hear what my troop was telling me. I could not understand if they told me to stop. I could not understand if they told me to look somewhere or to go somewhere. I just, my hearing was completely blocked. Now, this is something that I did not know, and it's not written anyway. It's something that I have now learned because I have 
had this experience today and in fact we decided to test this and we made some experiments that I would like to share now with you. Let me show you how difficult sometimes it was to understand the commands. I had my friend shouting pretending to be my Centurio, my Centurion and I noticed that I could only understand him up to a certain distance. Check this out. Okay, now you have to multiply this for the entire uh, century. So, 80 men moving their armor, making a lot of noise. From this I can understand that most likely the only people who could understand what the centurion was saying, even if he was shouting, particularly in the midst of battle where also you had barbarians screaming and people c collapsing on the floor and blood everywhere and then the clash of weapons and shields is only the probably the first row with the centurion and all the others started to imitating what the people in the front were doing because and this is something interesting because i always think you know the centurion gives the order or even the general never mind the general i have no idea what the senate what the uh, legatus is saying anyways even if i am just one one century a distance from the legatus so this is why uh, Centurionis, the centurions are so important they give the order and you do what you see the rows in front do now another thing that I wanted to discuss in this video is let's talk about the reality of marching because often we focus on the um, on the fact that the legion is is coming from for example Rome and then we we are immediately in Gallia okay we are in Gaul and we're like yes the Romans marched from Rome to Gaul but what did it actually mean to march for such a long time it would have been an extenuating and exhausting experience I mean I marched for a few hours uh, yesterday and I have to say that it was exhausting of course it was very tiring but it also made me think because you would join the army when you were 17 you would join the legion when you were 17 so as a 34 year old man I would have already had been I would have already spent half of my life in the legion okay but let's say that you are a new uh, soldier I can't even fathom what it meant if you had plantar fasciitis which I happen to have which if so those of you who have it it means that your feet sometimes hurt so much that it's terrible walking on them and I'm sure that it happened uh, out of 6,000 men I'm sure that someone did have this condition um, even if that's not the case what if you have stomachache, a headache? They think they would stop the entire legion on the march of 6,000 men because you're not feeling well on that day? No. So these soldiers had to march on top of the stomachache, headaches, toothaches. Maybe you had insomnia. I have insomnia sometimes. So perhaps you didn't even sleep well. You only slept two hours or one hour and now you have to march for an entire day. Imagine that because it must have happened. We just don't think about it. The human condition of marching. Let's say you have a light fever. What does it mean to march in those conditions? What if you had to go to the toilet? Do you think the whole legion is going to stop to, to wait for you? You've got to keep it until the legion stops and then you can all sort of refresh yourselves. Let's put it this way. And besides, please keep in mind that the way I have marched, the way I marched yesterday was rather light because I was just wearing what you, a Roman legionary would wear in battle. But when they were marching um, from point A to point B, um, you would be carrying a lot more stuff. And not only you would be wearing uh, all your, your armor and everything, but you would also carry your tunics and you would carry your impedimenta. Impedimenta is all the things that you will need, for example, rations of food for several days. Uh, you would have pans and everything you need for cooking. You would have your bed. You would have all the things that you need for your entrenchment. You, you would have building materials. You would have stakes for the palisade. You would carry pickaxes. Anyways, impedimenta alone could weigh as much as 40 kilos on top of the armor, on top of the scutum, and, and all the things you're already carrying. And I will do this one day. I will try this. I, I just need to, you know, order all these things up. Um, but we will do this. So the marching I've done yesterday is just combat marching. We will see that sort of marching, how much it can last. Interestingly enough, another point that I noticed that I have experienced today, uh, yesterday as I marched, is that the heaviest component is indeed the scutum. That is the thing that really tires me down the most. The armor, well, I had a good subarmalis underneath the armor. My shoulders were padded. So, yes, it 
it hurts, my, my muscles are still sore today, but I could, I could keep it, you know, I could do it. And I imagine someone who does it every day, it wouldn't be a, that much of a problem for them. Um, the helmet would keep me hot, and I can understand, this is why during long march, marches, if they were not in enemy territories, they would just uh, keep, um, put the helmet on top of their bosom, you know, just lace it so that you could have fresh air. Um, but the scutum, you know, keeping the scutum with the left hand was really tiring, so I would imagine that soldiers would have to switch hands sometimes. This is why when they were not in enemy territory they would just carry it on the back inside of a leather covering but that was not possible if they were marching to go to fight so imagine you know carrying that shield for many hours and then having to fight you know this is again something I have, I have found out yesterday the shield the scutum is definitely the um, m the component that tires me down the most pilum is not too bad because it's resting on my shoulder all right, so this is for today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it. You enjoyed both the visuals of it, but also the things that we could learn together. Thank you very much for your time as always, and I will see you tomorrow for my next daily upload. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye. Walete. No, I'll put this in the Oi! Dove è la tua macchina? Là. Ok, andiamo. Un momento così, questo è difficile.
Magari che entra in macchina dobbiamo farlo comunque. Però.